Hello everybody, welcome back to statistics. Today we're in section 5.3 and we'll be talking about independence and the multiplication rule. Today I'm going to show you how to identify independent events and I'll also show you how to calculate probabilities using the multiplication rule for independent events. Let's get started. Now you'll remember from section 5.2 that we had the addition rule for disjoint events to help us compute the probability of E or F. And now the multiplication rule is going to help us calculate the probability of E and F. And just as the addition rule required E and F to be disjoint, the multiplication rule requires E and F to be independent. So let me give you a definition for independence. Two events, E and F, are independent if the occurrence of event E in a probability experiment does not affect the probability of event F. For example, the outcome of one coin flip does not affect the outcome of the next coin flip. So two coin flips are independent of each other. Two events are considered dependent if the occurrence of event E in a probability experiment does affect the probability of event F. For example, the occurrence of the event drawing a club from a standard deck of cards does change the probability that the event drawing a diamond will occur on the next draw because the event of drawing a club affects the proportion of diamonds to the rest of the deck. Now let's look at example one and all we're going to do here is determine if two events are independent or not. So the first one says, suppose you flip a coin and roll a die. Are the events obtain a head and roll a five independent or dependent, and why? Well, if I flip a coin and I get heads, then that does not affect at all the probability that I'll get a five when I roll the die. So these two events are independent because the occurrence of obtaining a head does not affect the probability of rolling a five. And part B, are the events earned a bachelor's degree and earn more than $100,000 per year, independent or dependent, and why? Well, we know that people with a bachelor's degree earn more on average, and I'm sure you think that too, or you wouldn't be in school. So I think it's safe to say that earning a bachelor's degree does affect the probability of earning $100,000 a year. So these two events are dependent because the occurrence of the bachelor's degree does affect the probability that you'll earn $100,000 a year. And part C, two 24-year-old male drivers who live in the U.S. are randomly selected. Are the events male number one gets in a car accident during the year and male number two gets in a car accident during the year, independent or dependent, assume the males were randomly selected. That is, you can assume that they're not neighbors or friends or anything like that, so they're not going to get into an accident with each other. Well, just for instance, consider a male in Tennessee and a male in Nevada. Now, the occurrence of male number one in Tennessee having a car accident could not possibly affect the probability of male number two in Nevada having a car accident. So I'm going to say these two events are independent because the occurrence of an accident for male number one does not affect the probability of an accident for male number two. Now, a lot of people get disjoint and independent mixed up, so I want you to remember that disjoint is not the same as independent. Two events are disjoint if they have no outcomes in common. In other words, if two events are disjoint, then knowing that one event occurred means we know that the other event did not occur. However, independence means that the occurrence of one event does not affect the probability of the other event. So, it's possible for two disjoint events to be dependent or independent, and it's possible for two independent events to be either disjoint or not disjoint. So again, disjoint means that the two things can't happen at the same time, but independent means that the occurrence of one does not affect the probability of the other one happening next. Now here's the multiplication rule for independent events. If E and F are independent events, then the probability of E and F 
is equal to the probability of E times the probability of F. And here's an example for us. In the game of roulette, the wheel has slots numbered 0, double zero, and 1 through 36. A metal ball rolls around a wheel until it falls into one of the numbered slots. What is the probability that the ball will land in the slot numbered 17 two times in a row? Now we have 38 possibilities here because we have 1 through 36 and we also have slot 0 and slot double zero. And now the probability that the ball lands on 17 twice is the probability that it lands on 17 the first time and 17 the second time. And that and is important because the word and is what tells us that we're going to need the multiplication rule. And we need to figure out if these two events are independent. Because remember, the multiplication rule only applies to independent events. So if you think about how a roulette wheel works, it doesn't matter what the ball landed on last time you spun the wheel. The ball has an equal chance of landing on any of these 38 slots the next time you spin the wheel, regardless of what happened before. So these two events are independent, and the probability of rolling 17 the first time and 17 the second time then is going to be equal to the probability of rolling 17 the first time times the probability of rolling 17 the second time. And the probability of rolling 17 is 1 out of 38 because there's only one slot numbered 17, but there are 38 possibilities. So 1 over 38 times 1 over 38 gives us approximately 0 .000693. So it's a very, very, very small chance that the ball will land on 17 twice in a row in fact, it's near impossible. Now, the multiplication rule can be extended to as many events as necessary. We're not just locked into using it two events at a time. So, if event 1, event 2, event 3, and so on to event n are independent events, then the probability of event 1 and event 2 and event 3 and so on to event n is equal to the probability of event 1 times the probability of event 2, times and so on to the probability of event n. So you just keep multiplying those probabilities together. Now let's look at example 3, which is about life expectancy. The probability that a randomly selected 24-year-old male will survive the year is 0 0.9986. What is the probability that three randomly selected 24-year-old males will survive the year. So first, let's realize that the probability that all three males survive is equal to the probability that the first one survives and the second one survives and the third one survives. And I like for you to say it that way because if you hear the word and, that helps you know that you're supposed to be multiplying instead of adding. Now before we apply our multiplication rule, we need to think about whether these are independent events. And I think it's fair to say that they are independent because the male population is large enough that the survival of one male does not affect the survival of another male. So let's go ahead with the assumption that the events are independent. So we can say that the probability that the first one survives and the second one survives and the third one survives is going to be equal to the probability that the first one survives times the probability that the second one survives times the probability that the third survives. So now the probability that any one male will survive is 0.9986. So we say 0.9986 for the first one times 0.9986 for the second one times 0.9986 for the third one. And the probability that all three survive is approximately 0.9958. Now, I've made a big deal a couple of times out of rounding your probabilities to three decimal places, but here in this section, because the decimals we're dealing with are so small, they will tell us how many decimal places to keep. So read the instructions in My Labs Plus. Sometimes it might be four decimal places, sometimes it might be five. I'm going to keep four decimal places on most of the examples in this section, but just keep an eye out for the instructions in My Labs Plus. Here is another example, and this is one that I pulled out of your homework exercises. This one says, for a parallel structure of two identical components, 
the system can succeed if at least one of the components succeeds. Assume that components fail independently and that each component has a 0.15 probability of failure. Would it be unusual to observe one component fail? Would it be unusual to observe two components fail? Okay, so first we need to think about what we mean by the word unusual. Remember that an event is considered unusual if its probability is less than 5%. So what we need to do is calculate the probability that one out of the two components fails, and then calculate the probability that both components fail. And if either one is less than 5%, we will say that that event is unusual. So now the question is, how are we going to calculate the probability that one out of the two components fails? Well, I think it will be helpful for us to look at the possible outcomes. For a system of two components, the possible outcomes are that both components fail, or that the first one fails and the second one succeeds, or that the first one succeeds and the second one fails, or that both components succeed. Now, for the event that one component fails, the two outcomes we're interested in are fail succeed and succeed fail. So now, let's calculate the probability that the first component fails and the second component succeeds. You might be tempted to say that since there are four outcomes here, the probability of having a failure and a success is one out of four. But remember, these outcomes are not equally likely. The probability that any one component fails is only 0.15. So that means the probability that any one component succeeds is 0.85. So now, to find the probability that the first component fails and the second component succeeds, we're going to need our multiplication rule for independent events. Remember, they told us we could assume that the components fail independently. So the probability that the first component fails is 0.15, and the probability that the second component succeeds is 0.85. So we multiply these together, and we get a probability of 0.1275. Now we can do the same thing for the probability of succeed fail. This is the probability that the first component succeeds and the second component fails. So that's going to be 0.85 times 0.15, which is 0.1275. So now the probability that we have exactly one failure is the probability that we have fail succeed or succeed fail. So that or tells us to add. So we add 0.1275 plus 0.1275 and that comes to a total of 0.255, which means we have a probability of 25.5%. So that's far more than 5%, so we would say no, it is not unusual to have one component fail. Now to find the probability that two components fail, we would have to find the probability that the first one fails and the second one fails. So the probability that the first one fails is 0.15, times the probability that the second one fails is 0.15. So using our multiplication rule, that gives us a probability of 0.225, which is 2.25%, and that's less than 5%, so yes, it would be unusual to see two components fail. And then part B, what is the probability that a parallel structure with two identical components will succeed? In other words, we want to find the probability that the first component succeeds and the second component succeeds. So now we know that each component has a probability of failure of 0.15, and we know that if the probability of failure is 0.15, then the probability of success is 0.85. You know, those are complements because each component has to either fail or succeed. So the probability that each component succeeds is 0.85. Now, the probability that we have two components succeed is the probability that the first one succeeds and the second one succeeds. And that's going to be 0.85 times 0.85, and that is 0.7225. So the probability that a parallel structure with two identical components will succeed is 0.7225. 
And one more example from the homework exercises. This one also has a Part A and a Part B. So this says among 21 to 25 year olds, 29% say they have driven while under the influence of alcohol. Suppose that three 21 to 25 year olds are selected at random. Part A, what's the probability that all three have driven while under the influence of alcohol? So we want to find the probability that all three have driven under the influence. That would mean that the first one has driven under the influence and the second one has and the third one has. Now 29% say they have driven while under the influence. So the probability that the first selected 21 to 25 year old has driven under the influence is 0.29 and the probability that the second one has is also 0.29 and the probability that the third one has is also 0.29. So 0.29 times itself times itself gives us a total probability of 0.0244, which is equivalent to 2.44%. So it's not very likely that all three of our randomly selected 21 to 25 year olds have driven under the influence. Now let's ask ourselves, what is the probability that none of the three has driven while under the influence. So now to find this, we'll need to know the probability that each one has not driven under the influence. So the probability that a randomly selected person, 21 to 25, has not driven under the influence is going to be the complement of the probability that they have driven under the influence. So one minus 0 0.29 is 0 0.71. The probability that they have not driven under the influence is 0 0.71. So now the probability that none of our three randomly selected people has driven under the influence means that the first one has not, and the second one has not, and the third has not. So that's going to be 0 0.71 times 0 0.71 for the second person times 0 0.71 for the third person for a total probability of 0 0.3579. So the probability that none of them have driven under the influence is 35.79% or 0 0.3579.